Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting. Additional support is provided by Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin, Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, and Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Aerial Property Advisors, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Goldman Properties, Moynian Group, Must Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Rosewood Realty Group, Terra CRG, Triangle Equities. <laughs> Everyone wants to live in New York City. Everybody wants to live in New York City and convenient New Jersey. They want to be in rental buildings. They want to be in condo buildings. And today I have assembled the people who are building apartments in all different areas. My guests, they include Carl Goldberg, who is the managing principal at Roseland Property Corp. Mickey Naftali, who's the chairman and CEO of the Naftali Group. Zeal Feldman, who's the chairman and CEO of HFZ Capital Group. And last but not least, my buddy, Steve Whitkoff, who's the chairman and CEO of the Whitkoff Group. So, Stevie, how is the world in 2012? How do you see the market today? I think, I think today the, the Manhattan market is, uh, in fact, the overall New York market is a very strong market. In fact, I was just reading an article about how... Stop reading. I mean, Mickey, I'll tell you what's <laughs> going on. No, but about how Brooklyn renters are now looking to come back into Manhattan because they're getting priced out of the Brooklyn market, so... But it's uh, New York is a is a is a nice place to live and work and hopefully it continues. Now the interesting situation is you know I have I got three people. Uh, it's it's rather interesting the way it's set up. I mean Zeal and you are really doing more in the condominium focused world, and Carl and Mickey are really doing more in the residential rental world. How do you? What do we have in the condominium world? Do we have a world of a, a, a tale of two cities? Do we have the lower price and the ultra high price? Because Zeal was saying prior to the show that he's doing this conversion of this building on 68th Street at, at some very nice numbers, and then you were talking about your 51st Street deal, which is a different market. So how do you see it, Zeal? Well, there's no inventory on all levels, mid-market and, and upper market. So um, some of what we profess is still untested. There's a lot of high volume on very little product. So the real question is, what is the depth of the market ultimately? <coughs> and that's our biggest concern would be probably more in the mid-price range, um, which would probably be in Manhattan, 15, believe it or not, 1,500 to, let's say, almost $2,000 a foot. The high end, because of very little product, everything that's being offered for sale in prime buildings and prime locations are being purchased for ever increasing prices per foot, record prices per foot exceeding 2007. So here's the question. I mean, Mickey in his previous life, the reincarnation over <laughs> here, okay, Mickey did the plaza, you know, he did all of these major deals. I mean, 
the numbers you're talking about, he, w he would have been overjoyed if he could have got some <laughs> of these numbers, which he did. Who's buying today? Who do you think is going to be buying at Charles Street? Who's going to be buying at 1107? And who's going to buy? Who are the buyers? Are they people directly from New York? Are they citizens of the world? Okay, you know, who do you see as buyers? Uh, on the high end, we're seeing a lot of farm purchasers. You hear, you've been reading and you've been hearing about flight to capital to the city. It's absolutely true. Um, Chinese, uh, Middle Eastern types, both, both Arabs and Israelis, um, huge Asian contingency as well. Uh, we have a Frenchman who have, in the last three or four months have expressed a lot of interest um, in, in downtown Manhattan where we have a project that we bought the debt called the Satai Wall Street. Um, we're selling out almost all to investors, and there it's also Europeans who are looking to park money. So, so here's the question. Oh, do we have investors or do we have users? Do you see in your property people who are going to live there? Because the Satai, it sounds like it's investors is what you're saying, as opposed to people who are going to be living in that apartment. Steve? Well, I think on Charles Street, which is in the West Village, you, they've downzoned it, so you can't build it anymore. It's it's, we don't see foreign investors buying there. We don't think, um, we think it's people who really want to live in the village, very unique. And actually, I think at 1107, it's probably going to be like that too. But we have a project where we bought debt on 72nd Street, uh, the Miravel, and we have plenty of Chinese buyers there. Um, and so I think... Chinese buyers to live or Chinese buyers to invest? You know, it's unclear to me, but I think it's a combination of both. But... Um, and, I, and I'll tell you something, if they pass these immigration laws, which would allow you to have an extended <coughs> visa if you buy, right. then you're going to see it even more. And if you think about it, if the calculus is, where is my money best protected if I want that visa, it's probably New York. And who's renting in your developments? I mean, you are like the, the king of New Jersey residential today. Who's, who's renting in your your t in your projects, you have four projects you were saying uh, before. We have a combination of uh, young professionals, both married and not married, as well as empty nesters who are leaving the suburbs and coming back uh, to urban locations along the Hudson River waterfront, uh, firstly for access to Manhattan, and communities like Jersey City, West New York, Weehawken, they almost operate now as if they were the sixth borough of Manhattan because of the adjacency of mass transportation. And the price point differential is significant. So if you have people, for example, who live on Wall Street and make $150,000 or $200,000 a year, which is relatively modest by Wall Street standards, they can live in Jersey City at rents that are 65% of what Manhattan rents might be and commute to their places of business in downtown Manhattan in shorter times than they if they lived on the Upper West Side. And what's the rents? The rents are about $45 a square foot for the top tier buildings in Jersey City and we have a comparable product on 21st Street in Manhattan called the Echelon where those same apartments would rent for $85 a square foot so there's a significant difference. And Mickey? Well, we, we are uh, building right now two apartment buildings in uh, Brooklyn, one in Park Slope. And you had to get a passport for you, I mean, <laughs> you to, to, to learn Brooklyn. I'm a Brooklyn boy, so it's a different case. <laughs> yeah, and so so really the, the rents uh, at Park Slope and Borm Hill are around 55 bucks a foot. Uh, and, you know, it's still, it's a great price compared to what we see in the, you know, in a prime, a brand new ground up, uh, you know, a project in, in Manhattan today, uh, which, you know, 85 and some of the buildings are reaching up to 100 bucks a foot. We also, uh, going back to the condominium market, which is interesting because my career, I built my career on the condominium market and I'm, I'm doing part of my project, few of my projects right now on the rental side because there is a very unique opportunity in the market. We are also uh, converting a building on 82nd Street um, between Amsterdam and Columbus. And this is going back to your question. We are expecting to see actually local buyers, the New Yorkers buying in, in, in such a building. Um, I think that uh, going back to, uh, you know, I'm going back to, uh, to the 2006, 2007, when I was, 
you know, getting $7,000 a square feet, selling some of the units at the plaza, I think that there is still room in, in some of the, the very high-end projects, what, what Zill is doing right now, you know, a 68 and Madison is a prime, prime location. He will be able to reach a very, very high dollar per square feet because they're really, really uh, demanding the market and there is almost no product. Now, what about, uh, I mean, you also have, Ma you have Madison Square Park at 1107 in one area and then Zill has Madison Square Park. One Madison. One Madison. Uh, one Madison. <laughs> Uh, what do you see happening in that market, uh, in your site? Well, again, there is no inventory in one Madison Park. So it's become, the park itself has created followers from all over the world. And generally in Manhattan, you, you, you command a premium of at least 25% if you want to park generally. So one Madison Park, Bryan Park, uh, Union Square Park, and certainly Central Park is always commanding a big premium. Down in the Flatiron District, you know, comps until this recent um, cycle have always really been, you know, in the low to mid teens. So people are contemplating two, three thousand dollars a foot. It's really untested, but we believe that market is certainly for the right product is extraordinarily strong and hopefully. So he here, here's the question: You have all, all of you have these developments, and since basically developers have this mantra that. After I finish one development, I have to do another development. Where can where, where can you get land, and where what's the price, and how expensive is it today to, to to build? I mean, Brooklyn, you know, as we said prior to the show, Mickey, right. you know, a couple years ago, you know, eighty dollars a foot, seventy dollars a, right. a developable foot. It was well, it depends where, right? It was it depends on right. where. Where can any of you today find land, and what's prices of development sites? Look, first of all, I, 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 at least personally, I disagree that you have to do something. And really, I mean, going back to, uh, to 2006, 2007, I didn't buy anything in New York because I felt that the I was making a generalization <laughs> about the developers. So, okay. yeah, I didn't mean you. Right. No, no, no. But, but I mean, overall, I think, I think all of us here, I, you know, um, hopefully know when, when to stop and when the market is at the peak of the market, you slow down. And Kenny Rogers, and you know, the gambler, you know, <laughs> right. hold them, when to stop, okay? Right, but look, I mean, it really depends on the location. I mean, you can, you can get as, as high as, uh, you know, as high as $1,000 a foot in some of the locations in, in the city. I mean, if you will find anything around Central Park in either Central Park South or, or West, you will get uh, easy to a uh, thousand bucks a foot. And if you go to, um, you know, to Brooklyn, to Greenpoint, you will pay probably 80 to 100 bucks a foot. So it really depends. So here's a question which, you know, you had 184 Kent Street. Uh, Williamsburg has been very hot, you know, over the past couple of years, especially with the redevelopment. But part of the reason for Williamsburg being so hot was the L train. The L train is really good. Greenpoint... You don't have the L train. You have the G train, and you don't have you have the ferry, but you have the ferry. You have the ferry, right. which is good. But you you know the ferry even better because right. of, uh, of the involvement with New Jersey. Uh, How do you see the Greenpoint market? And I mean, he's he needs a passport to get the Greenpoint. <laughs> now, I think you bring up a good <laughs> point that's really worthy of further conversation, and that is this concept of adjacency to mass transportation and how that drives the product and creates neighborhood and attracts the market to that location. And I think when you talk about the kind of urban infill redevelopment that we're all engaged in, especially in Brooklyn or New Jersey, it really is about access to mass transportation right. and people being able to commute to their jobs in Manhattan in a very easy, inexpensive manner. And you see that with the ferry, the Trans-Hudson Ferry System. You see that with the light rail, the path. And that's why Jersey City and Hoboken have become what they are in New Jersey, because they allow people to access Manhattan jobs at much lower prices and with a better commute than if they lived in Manhattan itself. And so... Uh, I, I mean, in reality, you know, I grew up in, near Coney Island, right in, I went to school in Coney Island. Coney Island, you know, you have the water, you have, it's the same thing as the same, but 
it's a it's a schlep. I mean, the train ride from Coney Island is over an hour. You know, right. you know, it's the last stop on the train. Uh, and you know, do you see? I mean, you've been over your career, Stephen. You know, you've you've been up in Harlem. You've been around. You've go, you've gone to different markets. Do you see perhaps? Um, would you develop in Coney Island? We develop anywhere. I just think. You know, New York is a pretty magical place today. But I think what Call is saying, and I think it's very appropriate because it does relate. The one-hour commute from to Coney Island to the city is a problem, and part of the problem even relates to Staten Island. You know, many people, when when the real estate board comes out with their history, you know, statistics, they don't even include in their sales statistics and their rental numbers the borough of, Man uh, of Staten Island. Yeah, but you'll you'll see the. You know, you'll see the circumference go further out, the boundaries go further out if more jobs come into this town. I mean, if we start seeing more tech jobs and if they pull back Dodd-Frank a little bit and the banks start hiring again. I remember, Mike, when I was younger and I was practicing law, people commuted from, I mean, deep into New Jersey and out in Suffolk County. It was no big deal. It was nothing for my father to take the Long Island Railroad and travel an hour and ten minutes. For the right jobs, people that that that's the big issue, right? If you right. if there's big job creation, then um, now he, here's an issue. Why would you not thing. travel from Coney Island? I mean, Call and, and Roseland, Marstown was always a beautiful town, correct? But it wasn't a resurgence a couple of years ago. Where are the people who are living in your Marstown development working? They're working in, you know, Parsippany on the I-287 corridor, uh, on the I-78 corridor. Those are not Manhattan-centric jobs. But they are part of what I think is really driving the apartment industry right now and making it so white hot. And that is, is there a fundamental shift in the way people in the United States are living and as you see rates of home ownership plummet, and you see people turning to the amenities and the um, mass transportation opportunities in, in apartments, is that a short snapshot of what's happening now, or is there a fundamental shift in how people see their lifestyles in the United States, in the Manhattan market included, where home ownership is not what it was touted to be? And, Steve brought up his father, and I'll bring up my father for a second. When I first got married in 1976, my father said to me, well, everything you do, you need to save every penny you have to accrue a down payment to purchase your first home, because that's your only pathway to wealth. That, wait, wait, my father said that. Right. <laughs> so the, my question to everybody is that... It, it was part of the bar uh, <laughs> Right. You, you know, when you... <laughs> May you bless did, you, did your father make you turn off the lights every night? Okay. Right. So, <laughs> sure. but is, uh, the question is, is that true <laughs> any longer? Do people still feel that way? Do our kids, I have a 27-year-old and a 30-year-old, do they feel that way? Well, I do. I do. I mean, I, I, I never even wanted a mortgage on a house. I was so, you know, I was raised in a very conservative way, you know. But, um, yeah, I know. I think people want to live in the cities today. I mean, you see it even down in Miami. People want to live, uh, right. you know, they want to live in Miami and in, in, in the Brickle Corridor. They, people want to live in the cities. But I think, look, we, uh, we love rentals. We've done plenty of rentals in our career. And if we could find the land where we could build a rental successfully, we'd build it a lot faster than we would condo. On, uh, until you, I mean, I think if you said to Zeal, why are you doing condo as opposed to rental on 68th Street? Because he oh. paid a price that sort of demands but, but condo as an exit. But, the, but that's and, and he's going to do great. But I'll give you an example. On your project on 51st Street and 2nd, you could possibly get a nice we, rent as we, a rental. We can build it to a, a seven and a half cap, frankly. But my concern on rentals generally in New York is your rents are only coming down and your expenses are only going up. I still don't see rents continuing their upward trend that they are. They're being purely driven by, by many other factors. One of it is a lack of inventory. What a big, any renter who can live for no more than 20% more and own as opposed to rent in New York is going to be a buyer, assuming everything else is equal. And with rates as cheap as you're talking about our parents, our parents' mortgages were more expensive than our mortgages on interest rates, unbelievably it is today. Right. 
I'm not long on underwriting these four caps, five caps. Now, the interesting thing is when I've had shows on affordable apartments, uh, you know, literally affordable through the city and other things, it's difficult for people, I don't know if you have any for sale today, it's difficult for, for people in a certain level to get a mortgage. Right. I mean, that, it's that's very, very difficult exactly. for the FICO scores uh, right. are higher. The, right. the, the, so I don't think that there is a change. My, personally, I don't think that there is a change in the culture. Uh, it's really about uh, getting the, the end loans. Some of the or most of the foreign buyers that are coming in are basically buying all cash. So that's a no, no issue. That's a different one. And But what we see, I think, and I agree with Zeal, look, I mean, the rental, the rental market is on fire. And when rents are coming up to, you know, in the best buildings to 100 bucks a foot, that's a point that you move back to, to, to buy a condo because it doesn't make sense to rent anymore. So the question is, if you as, as so-called a buyer can get the end, the end loan or not. We're in an extremely unique and uh, interest environment right now. Interest rates are so low, so whoever can get a loan, can get a mortgage, will, will take a mortgage and, and buy a condo today. It's only, it makes sense. So, you know, going back to rental, I, I think, look, the residential market as a whole is, is really doing great in, in, in New York City. Uh, re rental versus versus condo is, is basically based on the location and the opportunity that you have. Both of them are very good. It really depends on the location and the opportunity. Now, you know, I do a lot of review and analysis. The, the number of sales today on the reasonable price condominiums, I'm talking about 800 to 1,000, you know, Williamsburg and all that, they've gone up because people are buying in, in that marketplace. Right. Um, in Queens, one of the highest number of purchases was in Flushing, where the average price was $600. But many of the people paid cash because of, of, of the situation. But, you know, we've we got to look at, at the market as it is. How, let's, let's play the other side. Every one of you is building. How are lenders coming to you with regard to, have they loosened the purse strings on financing of construction loans? Call, Nikki. I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, putting together the financial engineering to start these buildings is significantly easier. But I think, as was suggested earlier in this conversation, you have to be able to demonstrate a yield that's real and budgets that are accurate and well thought out. So the underwriting criteria are much more difficult, but the money is available. And what about the, the recourse, you know? Yeah, but before the recourse, I think that what, what is the, the big difference is, yes, there is no question it's easier to borrow money today, but, but the lenders are really, really, um, you know, uh, picky about who they're lending to. So if that's you're not, accurate. and that's and, the, and that's the difference in the market. So you don't see, you know, all those so-called one-time developers that enter into the market and, and just got financing. So what we see, that's I how think- the, the, That's how these two guys bought their properties no, recently. No, those, they, no, no, the, no, no, the not top them. experts. No, 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 they <laughs> bought it because somebody bought the property before who was right. inexperienced. No. Correct. Okay, that's what I'm saying. And then you've been able to take over because the bank in many cases Co gave them the Correct, so, the so if right you're, if you're, there is a tier of develop, a, 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 a very, narrow tier of, of players, developers, and, and investors that can really get financing today in a relatively low, low, you know, very attractive rates. But if you're not part of, of this group, either you don't get financing or you pay a lot for it. And it's nowhere near the leverage levels, Mickey, right? Right, that, that right. It's 50, 60 percent leverage. That's with, the best borrowers. With, right, the right. best borrowers with pristine financial statements right. with, with top-end top recourse. And so, um, I think they're pretty careful, and right. we're just ta we're talking Manhattan. We're talking New York now. Right. Take this. You, 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 there's no conversation down in Miami. I can tell you that. Right. right. But there, you know, I had dinner last night with the president and CEO of a 13 or a 14 billion dollar New Jersey-based bank, and we were talking about he's into the lending business, and I said construction lending. He says, Yeah, we're we're doing it. 
and but he brought out a very interesting. He says we did in 2006 and 2007, and the 170 million dollars of bad loans that we had, 85 million were for bad construction loans. And but he said, you know, I like the yield. I said, you know, there's there's a risk reward. You know, it's nice that you're getting a higher price in, on your interest, but you're taking a much more risk situation, and banks are risk reward oriented. I tell you, I, we're doing two construction loans now. If you look at, th these are 50% loans that are probably a nine unlevered to the debt if, they, if the buildings were converted to rentals. Those are incredible credits for banks right. to lend on to right. them. So it's a pretty interesting place for banks to lend, and they have to get their money out. So why not in this market? I think, by the way, they'll, 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 the banks will migrate out of New York. They'll, they'll be down in the other major markets soon. Now, we, you know, you brought up the fact that your dad uh, lived in Long Island and commuted. There are limited, and I've done shows and you've been on some of my panels on this, there's, there's a total lack of um, affordable housing in Long Island, but there's a need for housing in Long Island the same way that Carl and right. Roseland has done that. Uh, and we spoke about this once. Do you think Zeal or you would ever go to that part? I know it was hard enough for Mickey to get to Brooklyn, but you know, to to Long Island to develop. I mean, they're going to have to change it a lot. I mean, look, they've 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 retreated on a lot of things in New in New York City. There's no more 80-20 right. funding really. 421's 421 up in the air. Yeah. Uh, you know, until you do those sorts of things in these in these places where it's hard to underwrite rents, you're not going to get developers you, you, coming in. You, but, but you bring up a very interesting point, tax abatements. Right. right. Without tax abatements, how do developers, I mean, you know, Zio was bringing up a great point before about operating expenses in the building. Taxes today could be $25 a square foot for a building in Manhattan mm -hmm. if you don't have abatement. Correct. Uh, I mean. I think that's an excellent point. And I will tell you, none of the development that took place along the Hudson River waterfront over the last decade would have done so without the benefit right. of payment in lieu of tax agreements. Right. Because the underlying ad valorem rates were so volatile as to create a situation where the lenders could not underwrite the debt accurately. And so New Jersey fortunately came to the conclusion accurately that they needed to fix those tax obligations as a percentage of gross receipts and that opened up the door. So. Those kinds of government, for lack of a better word, subsidies are imperative. And I think with re, uh, I agree with you 100 percent, but I'm going to give you another point. You, we have today, we have a lot of buildings coming on in lower Manhattan, uh, of, you know, office buildings, and we have a lot of B and C <laughs> office buildings. And in the 90s, you remember you, when you bought properties down there, you were able to, if you converted them to a residential, you had a 421G and you had a full tax abatement. You don't have that today. That's How right. does somebody go in and take a building without a tax abatement and pay the full thing? They're not going to. I, I don't think at today's land prices that you can get you can get funding from a bank for a rental today. I don't believe no, it. For maybe, rental, you're right. maybe if you're Lenny Litwin, you can you know, with a Rudin family, but I mean, generally speaking, I just don't think that a bank is going to underwrite a rental right. unless you, there's a very, very deep check. So I, I think, you know, in conclusion, it, it looks like the market is great, but I have to be semi-pessimistic with what Zio is saying that, the you know, you can, you can rent an apartment to a point of a, a level, but, you know, sometimes as they would say, you can't cry uncle. I can't get any price. You have to make it reasonable, and the units are there. And I'd like to thank Carl Goldberg, uh, Mickey Naftali, Zio Feldman, and Steve Whitkoff, and I'll see you next week.